When we look at kids these days, especially these days, I mean, we'll go into a high school campus, and some of these kids look more mature than we do. Is that fair to say that? I mean, they're physically, their stature is much bigger, um, and, and the way that they speak, we think, you know, this is, a, this is a grown up. In every way, in every sense, this is a grown up. But what we're realizing more and more is that they're not. So I want to give you a very practical example before we even get started talking about the brain as to how they're different. Um, there was a study done that looked at how um, teenagers versus adults interpreted facial expressions. So in this study, uh, both a group of teenagers and adults were given a series of pictures. And this is the, one of the, a sample of the picture that they were given. And they were asked to describe the emotion that was experienced by the person in the photo. And so these options were, are they shocked? Afraid, angry, what was the person, what do you think the person was experiencing? So when they did this study with teenagers, what they found out is first, not only did they ask them the question, but they also did MRI imaging to look at what part of the brain was stimulated when the teenager were, and the adult were thinking about it. And if you notice, um, this is the teen brain and this is the adult brain. Now don't look at size because it's not, you know, the brain does not grow that much when they become an adult versus a teenager. But look at where the primary activity was in, in these two populations. See the teen brain? See where the activity primarily occurred when asked this question? In the adult brain, do you see where the activity occurred? Is it okay in the back or is it too, you can see it okay? So what they noticed was that in the adult, in the teenage brain, the lower brain was activated more. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But there was a drastic difference. Now, when they also looked at kind of the answers, um, what they found out was that in 100% of the adults, they got the emotions correct in the pictures. So when they were shown the different facial expressions of the people in the pictures, the, the adults were 100% accurate. In the teenagers, their accuracy was no better than 50%. Okay. Now, y'all are all nodding like, yeah, I, I, know, I totally know what that means. But, I, I mean, we really kind of need to take a step back and think about that. In 50% of the cases, when, they, when a teenager was looking at the facial expressions of somebody, they misinterpreted those expressions, okay? So a very tangible example of how the teenager's brain functions very differently than the adult brain. So not only are they, in those situations, reading the situation incorrectly, but then they're going to respond to it incorrectly. And what I hear a lot is, um, what we normally hear is, you know, when we talk to adults, they'll be like, well, uh, you know, surely the child knew I was upset. Or obviously the child knew I was concerned. Or, you know, of course they knew how important this was. You know, that's what we hear adults saying when they're talking about their frustrations with kids. Well, there is no obvious, there is no surely, there is no of course, because a lot of times these kids are not grasping that this is as important as you're saying it is. They're not grasping that you're really upset or really concerned or really afraid for them because they're reading the emotions incorrectly. So if someone's reading the emotions incorrectly, then their response is also going to be incorrect. And it may be the opposite. You may not have been upset with the child when you were talking to them, but they're interpreting that you were insulting them or that you were, you know, you know, in, you know what I'm saying? And so they're reacting to you in a way uh, that you're totally caught off guard going, why are they so upset by this? Why are they so bothered by this when they have misinterpreted what you've said and the emotion behind it? Okay, so what we're going to do is talk about the brain as a whole and then the different parts of the brain. And so we are going to get into things like frontal lobe and cerebellum and stuff like that because I really want you to be able to kind of wrap your mind around how the brain has developed during the teenage years, no pun intended. Um, but one thing I want to highlight first is, you know, back in the day when we were taught about brain development, we all kind of were under the impression that from zero to three, right, that's the critical age. That's when you expose them to Mozart. That's when you give them as much stimulation as possible. And after that, you're a goner. There's not much else you can do. Well, we're understanding now that that's not accurate and that brain development extends far beyond that. And so, but what we realize is that maybe the brain, the physical structure doesn't change, but the brain has a lot of elasticity and plasticity and it can make adjustments throughout childhood, into the teenage years, and even into early adulthood and even late adulthood. And so we're going to go through the different stages and how the brain changes over that time. There are three areas of the brain that I want to kind of highlight first. So everybody take your hands, put down your pencils for a second, wiggle your fingers, good, we're all good, we all passed the test, no, just make a fist, put your fists together. Okay, this is basically your brain. If you look at it, that's pretty much your brain. 
Some of you might have thought your brain was larger than this. No, it's not. I know you're very confident about that. That's good. But your brain is about this size, right? Some of you may swear that the person sitting next to you has a much smaller brain than this. Because um, I know you came in groups. No. So, but this is the brain, pretty much, in regards to it. It's kind of shaped like this, too. But the brain grows and matures from the bottom up and the inside out. And I want you to remember that. So it's from the bottom up and the inside out. You can put your hands down and write that if you feel like that's important. Bottom up, inside out. So we're going to talk about the different overall areas of the brain, and then we'll go into the specifics of the brain. So the bottom part of the brain is what we call the physiological center of the brain. And that part of the brain pretty much controls the basic human functions that are required to sustain life. And then y'all are all nodding. So this is kind of a review for some of you guys. This is your heart rate, your, your respiratory, blood pressure, the basic functions of your life. So obviously if we have somebody who's having trouble with this aspect of the brain, nothing else really matters. Fair to say that? So okay, that's the bottom. Now remember we said the brain grows from the bottom up and the inside out. If you do the fist again, if you open up, the middle, the inside of the brain, is more of your, the emotional center of the brain. And this is responsible. When we talk about emotions, we talk about the full range of emotions, including those very raw, kind of primitive emotions. Aggression, sex, attachment, all of those are kind of stimulant. And so that's what develops next. You have the bottom of the brain develop first, and then you have the emotional center of the brain develop next. The last part of the brain that develops is the cognitive which is the top part of the brain and the outside of the brain. Remember, bottom up, inside out. So notice the progression. And if you think about your own children, if you think about children that you've watched growing up, you've seen that. They go from just basically managing the basic human functions, you know, including potty and stuff like that, basic human functions, to managing emotion. You know, then they're kind of mastering all these different kinds of emotion. First, it starts off looking very angry. Everything is crying. Everything is, you know, whether it's I'm tired or I'm hungry or, you know, I want someone to play with me, it's all just crying. You know, so they're kind of working through those emotions and then the cognitive development happens later. So, interestingly, we see emotions come first and then the cognition control come later. That doesn't necessarily resolve itself at age seven. I mean, do we see that in teenagers also? Emotions are strong and forefront. The cognitive control comes much later. So we're going to go through the different areas of the brain um, and kind of discuss the development of those areas and kind of what they control. The first area is the cerebellum. And its basic function is in regards to movement, coordination, balance, things like that. But that continues to develop over time. So the cerebellum, what we realize is that the cerebellum is not just about coordinating the bodily movements, but it's also about coordinating the different parts of the brain and about ha having the brain function quicker and kind of more like a, a supercomputer, that concept. Does that make sense? The computer that manages all the other computers and, encourage, in, and encourages their efficiency. And if you think about kind of development over time, I know we watched the Olympics in the winter. Is that fair to say that? Remember how, we, how many of you admit to watching figure skating? Anybody do it? Okay. Those of you who don't, sure, yeah, that's okay. You turned it on for the commercials, I'm sure. Um, but so do you remember watching it? You'd have like, you'd see these amazingly talented, very young figure skaters, the 13 or 14 year olds, that basically what they would do is they would do a major trick, an amazing trick, and then kind of glide to the next trick. Did you ever see that? And there was not a lot of coordination between the trick to the next trick. They would stick their arms out and try to point their fingers. They would glide to the next trip and then do like a, a quadruple whatever, saw cow. And then they would glide again. As you, if you look at figure skaters that are more mature, they may not be able to do the triple or quadruple saw cows because they, you know, they're height to weight ratio changes, that type of thing. But the gracefulness or the coordination between the movements is, is much more sophisticated. And that's what we see in regards to brain development. Does that make sense? You may not have those raw skills, but what you'll see, even when it comes to the cerebellum and its development, is that there's improved coordination. There's improved, um, it's almost like finesse between processes, both physical and mental. So, and I know that's kind of a very, um, basic example, but you can see that. And you see the same in gymnasts, you see the same in athletes. 
that you'll have very, in basketball or in other sports, when they're young, they have this amazing raw talent. But they don't have the, the pieces that coordinate things. And you may have more mature players that don't have as much raw talent, but they are able to kind of look at the big picture and coordinate things and kind of function with finesse between those situations. Okay. What we realize about the cerebellum is that it continues to develop into early adult years. And we're going to talk about this a bit. How many of you are under 25? Let me just ask. Is anybody in here? Okay, so I'm not insulting you. Please don't take any of this personally. I'm sure you're very mature for your age. So, but what we realize is that a lot of development, and you know, part of this is kind of coming back to hear this now that you've, when you heard this first time, you know, you may have been in the 20, 18 year old range, and you were kind of like, what are they talking about that I'm not grasping things completely or I'm not doing the abstract reasoning the way I should? I mean, now kind of take a step and think about it. What you know now compared to kind of, and how you see the big picture is very different. Like I said, I'm sure you're very mature, and you're, that's why you're here today, because you're more mature than your age and things like that. So, but understand that when it comes to early, when they talk about early adult years, they're really talking about 23, 24, 25. So what, what we'll see is that when we talk about the immatures in the early adult years, they're looking at about 23, 24, 25 years of age. Okay, the next part of the brain that we want to talk about is the limbic system. And if you remember, the brain develops from the bottom up and the inside out. The limbic system is that central area within the brain. It's kind of one of the emotional centers of the brain. And the interesting part about the limbic system, and we're not going to cover every part of the brain today. I wanted to kind of highlight the critical parts that are kind of impacted by development. Um, is that in addition to being the emotional system of the brain, it's also deeply involved in long-term memory storage. And so let's take a step back and think about those things that you do remember from your early childhood. You know, do you tend to remember things that are benign and kind of just unimportant, or are your memories kind of surrounded uh, around emotional situations? And so it's not a surprise, but think about this again with the kids that you work with, whether it's uh, through CASA or at the school. Understand that kids' memories and the long-term memories are really strengthened around those emotionally laden situations. And so the things that are considered to them not important are probably those things that we value because they don't have emotion. They're more logical. They're more rational. So um, what we'll see is that with the limbic system, that changes, physical changes still occur in the brain through adolescence. So again, adolescence being 18 years of age. The corpus callosum, and there's not a picture of this because it's kind of a, a broader concept, are the, is a network that connects the two sides of the brain. Remember, you had two fists that you put together. Well, they, they have to communicate, although I, I know some people, I, I could be certain that they don't talk to, to each other. But for the most part, the brain has to be able to communicate, and that is the corpus callosum that does that. Um, what it allows for in regards to not only communicating across the brain, it allows for kind of more creative thinking more creative problem solving. And again, what we see is that this area of the brain continues to grow and change throughout puberty. So if you're asking for someone to kind of look at all sides of a picture and be able to look at a situation in many different ways, both emotionally and logically, and coordinate that thinking, that thinking is not in place until you know, middle puberty, late puberty. And then it takes a while for that to develop. When it comes to brain development also, I want to highlight that it's not an on-off switch. It's not like the structure is in place and then turns on and then functions perfectly from that point forward. The way that the brain works is very similar to how you see kids learning different things, whether it's academic issues or whether it's even like riding a bicycle. When someone rides a bicycle, you know, I know we say it's like riding a bike, you know, like once you learn it, you never forget it. But are you perfect every time you get on a bike once you've learned it? Right, no. It's hit and miss. I mean, there'll be some moments, especially for brand new bike riders, where you'll have these episodes of genius. Right? It's like, oh, look, he's got it. And you think the child's set and ready to go. And the next day, the child gets on the bike, and they face plant right onto the cement. And you're like, what happened? You know, he had it yesterday. Why did he not have it today? It takes a while for those processes to work. And even though the structure is in place, it's not immediate. It doesn't mean one, one, it's not one trial learning and it's perfected. It can look great one day and then struggle the next. And it's the same way if you think about kids learning math or you learning, you know, whatever you want to think about. It's not perfect. I mean, it's a hit and a miss. 
And then over time, you have more hits than misses, and that progresses as we move along. The next part of the brain I want to kind of highlight is the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is involved in processing a lot of different type of sensory information. Whether, and it kind of pulls all of that information together. What it's also, this is probably the one part of the brain that's pretty set early on. So it's, and if you think about it, it's actually part of the brain that starts losing its ability pretty early on. It's, so, you know, if you're saying, you know, I didn't pick up on that or I missed that or my visual skills aren't as great, you know how kids seem to pick up on every little detail that's in a, in a room and you're like, I didn't notice that or I didn't see that. Well, that's because that's part of the brain that actually peaks in about early adolescence and then it's downhill from there. But this part of the brain is the temporal lobe, the blue part right here. And the temporal lobe focuses on, again, memory formation and the processing of information. It also, um, what I kind of want to highlight with this is it's, it's really critical, especially in the auditory, storing of auditory information. And it, again, continues till late adolescence. So we oftentimes ask whether, you know, did they hear me? You, you know what I'm saying? And even when you ask a teenager, kid, you know, what did I say? And they repeat it. But is what, hearing it the same as listening to it? Does that make sense? And you know what I'm saying? I mean, they'll, you'll ask a kid, you know, what did I just say? And they'll be like, don't, da, 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 da. you know, because we've given them instruction, don't climb up the fence. And then they go and do it again. And you're like, what did I just say? You said, don't climb the fence. And you're like, well, why did you do it? I don't know. You know, because the question is, did they really he listen to it or did they just hear it and it, it was kind of stored in a different way? And so that's, again, a part of the brain that continues to develop in delayed adolescence. These are where we're really going to kind of highlight our, our focus today is on the frontal lobe because we really are talking about adolescent brain development and decision making is normally kind of the questions I get asked. The frontal lobe, remember, bottom up, inside out. The last part of the brain to be developed pretty much is the frontal lobe. That's the part of the brain that's involved in decision making, planning, and memory and impulse control. So what do teenagers lack? Yeah. <laughs> decision making, planning, memory, and impulse control, right? It's kind of how we, the, the critical part about this is, um, I mean, there's been a lot of research lately to support this, and because of that research, we've really kind of altered our perception, our understanding of teens. I don't know if you realize, with this most recent research, the, the Supreme Court changed rules about the death penalty. Were you aware of that? That we can no longer, based on a lot of this most recent research, you can no longer execute somebody who committed the crime prior to the age of 18. Not that 18 all of a sudden, like I said, turns on the light, but at least they have set a recognition or an understanding that even if the child committed an adult-like crime, their understanding or grasp of that situation is very different than that of an adult. And so if nowadays, if, and they're now re-evaluating whether you can even give a life sentence to someone who's committed a crime before the age of 18. So uh, this, this research in this literature is, it's really kind of forefront in regards to kind of altering how we approach um, the responsibility of teenagers. And, and I think eventually it'll also kind of address how the responsibility of the parents of these kids at some point. And we're going to go much more into this in a little bit, so let me kind of move on. The last part of the brain that um, really is the final to develop is the occipital lobe, and that's visual processing information. And the reason that I highlight this is because we look a lot, in, especially when driving, what is the, the sense that you need the most when you're driving? I mean, hearing is very important, although we tend to drown that out with our radio, our cell phones, you know, conversations in the car. But the, the visual acuity and the visual processing that we require, it, it's critical to driving. And what we see is that this aspect of the brain is probably the last to really get, to get formalized or finalized or structured. And so um, things that distract from teenage drivers is really important to kind of consider. And so in a lot of states, they have those graduated license requirements. Are you familiar with that? Where in some states, if you're under a certain age, you cannot have a passenger in your car. Um, you know, I'm threatening my daughter. She won't have a radio or, you know, she's 10 and she's already asking or 11 asking to drive. And I'm saying, well, when you drive, you're not going to have a radio. You're not going to have a cell phone. But it, those are critical pieces of information because they, one of the things is that they have 
senses that have yet to be developed completely. And so it's not that they don't physically look like an adult, it's not that they can't reach the pedals on the ground, but there are aspects of their brain that are not yet available to process all the information that you're, you're asking them to process when they drive.